some Arsenal fans actually cheering as they take off uh, the captain Granit Xhaka who looks rather unimpressed by being hauled off at this stage he's going to be from the Invincibles to the Insufferables, when Mikel Arteta rejoined Arsenal in December 2019, the club were in their lowest point since well before the inception of the Premier League. But fast forward to today and the club are in their strongest position for two decades. However, it wasn't exactly a smooth and easy ride. In fact, there was a moment in time where if you asked the large majority of Arsenal fans if they'd like the Spaniard to depart, the answer would have been a resounding yes. From embarrassing losses to Man City to even more embarrassing losses to Man City. Fans of the Emirates had to go through it all, however now it finally looks like they're out the other side. This is the incredible story of Mikel Arteta's Arsenal rebuild. Before I even start to cover Mikel Arteta, it's important for me to give context on the state of Arsenal when he took over. Having been at the club for 22 years, Arsene Wenger finally departed in 2018 being replaced by Unai Emery, who would have a decent first season at the club, however saw bottles in both the Prem and Europa League final cost them Champions League football for the third season in a row. In the following summer though, they spent big, most notably being a £72 million deal for Nicolas Pepe, who was just coming off an incredible season for Lille in which he scored 22 times and assisted another 11. This signing though is the first example I can speak about which covers what exactly went wrong for Unai Emery which is simply poor planning and squad building. Having seen the departures of Walcott, Sanchez, Chamberlain and even Awobi in recent seasons, Arsenal had a severe lack of depth in wide areas. Not only up front but also at the back where Sad Kalasinac and Kieran Tini were Arsenal's only real fullbacks able to push up and hold width for a winger that likes to cut in. And of course this was particularly an issue for Arsenal's new £72 million man as neither of them were on his side of the pitch. As well as this, Unai Emi rose to success as a counter-attacking manager, using the wings devastatingly in attacking phases, however at Arsenal the expectation is to dominate possession, making Unai Emery's life a whole lot harder. You see, possession-based football takes a long time to implement, not only in a group of players, but also in a manager. And back in 2019, Arsenal had neither the squad or the staff to play in this style. When playing out from the back, Granit Xhaka was often the deepest midfielder, forced to sit behind the ball as it was progressed up the pitch, however this simply isn't his game. Xhaka isn't able to act as a Busquets-esque build-up hub for Arsenal, and even more devastatingly, he wasn't good enough defensively to play the deepest role in midfield, meaning that if the ball was turned over and opposition teams could counter them, there was essentially no cover in front of the defence to stop them from being picked apart. In fact, the whole defensive unit was subpar with various mistake-prone players that led to Arsenal conceding goal after goal and as I mentioned earlier a lack of width up top had made it harder for them to score them as well. By having said lack of width it allowed opposition defences to stay more compact and Mesut Ozil was the only player with the ability to play passes which could unlock defences however due to a mix of his lack of defensive work and off-field issues the German was rarely ever selected by Unai Emery. To put it simply, Arsenal had a poor squad which struggled to both attack and defend as well as a toxic dressing room, something never more obvious than in an iconic 2-2 draw against Crystal Palace in October 2019. Having gone 2-0 up and also seeing a last minute winner disallowed by VAR, you may think that Arsenal's issues were primarily in defence in this game. However, when you look a little bit deeper, you can see each of these incidents came via corners and in an open play, Arsenal were far from dangerous. Lining up in a 4-4-2 throughout pretty much the entirety of the match, Nicolas Pepe and Danny Ceballos played in more central areas, leaving space out wide that Arsenal failed to really take advantage of and at times they even struggled to get the ball past the halfway line with Granit Xhaka being the man to drop deeper to collect it. However, was unable to really progress play with any enthusiasm. This would of course leave Crystal Palace to stay compact and aim to hit Arsenal in transition, which is seen through both goals as a penalty created from a long ball to Zahar and a deadly counter-attack in which Xhaka was fairly easily bypassed, perfectly encapsulated the problems with this Arsenal team. Oh yeah, and there was also that incident. Unsurprisingly then, Unai Emery would be sacked a few weeks later with the team down in 10th by the time Mikel Arteta took over on the 20th of December, which is where we saw the first phase of Arteta's rebuild. When the Spaniard walked through the door, Arsenal were in free fall, conceding goal after goal and struggling to put them in the other net, and so before he could even think about instilling his ideal style of play, he had to first stop the rot. 
His initial job was to make Arsenal more compact, often utilising a five-at-the-back system against the best teams, as well as bringing Lacazette back into the side and pushing Aubameyang to the wing, as the Frenchman had far better back-to-goal play and could make the side a far more cohesive unit. And despite a somewhat rocky start where Arsenal drew six of Arteta's first eight games, it seemed as if he'd made progress going into March after three consecutive wins in the league. However, then came a worldwide lockdown, halting all football. And after an embarrassing loss to Man City and then an even more embarrassing one to Brighton, which saw Matteo Guendouzi pretty much banished from the side, Arsenal found their stride once again, eventually finishing eighth, but more importantly, seeing an impressive run to the FA Cup final, where they'd face up against Chelsea, having already knocked Arteta's former side Man City out in the semis. It comes to Giroud and Pulisic in the final, and he makes no mistake. Now Aubameyang, it's still Aubameyang, it's absolutely brilliant. Christensen just leaves and catch her off the ball, but it's all over. Having beaten Chelsea in the FA Cup final, Arsenal had not only qualified for Europe but also allowed themselves a net spend of around £50 million in the summer, bringing in Cedric and William for depth, but more notably Gabriel and Thomas Partey, who allowed Arteta to begin the process of transforming this currently pragmatic counter attacking side into a more proactive possession dominant one. Thomas Partey not only covered large spaces better than Xhaka, but he also had the ability to act as a hub in builder. Similarly to Gabriel, who is far more confident on the ball than many other members of the Arsenal squad. Things didn't exactly start very well for the Gunners though, where after 14 games they were down in 15th as Arteta saw his job on the line going into a huge class against Chelsea at their Emirates. Youngster Emil Smith-Rowe was given a chance and had gone to shine, playing a huge role in not only a 3-1 win but also a fantastic second half of the season, which saw the Gunners rise up to 8th in the table. However, having failed to win a cup competition, it meant that Arsenal would miss out on European football for the first time since 1996. At the time, this was seen as a massive underachievement. However, over the course of the campaign, Mikel Arteta secretly laid the foundation for a season of development for the Gunners. Over the season, he offloaded well over £1 million a week in wages, freeing up room for a pretty sizable spend in the summer. But even more importantly, they'd taken the first steps in building a competent positional play side that could battle against even the best. And over the next summer, Arteta also took arguably the biggest step in creating a squad that could play his way. With Nuno Tavares, Sambi Lukonga and Ben White all coming in before an opening day clash against newly promoted Brentford. It was a relatively simple start to the season where surely nothing could go wrong. Okay, Brentford were far better than anyone expected. They could get going in their next game at least. Well, to be fair, Chelsea were champions of Europe with a new £100 million man up top. So who was up next? Oh no. Three games, three losses. The Arteta out slogan could be seen everywhere. However, nonetheless, the board continued to back their manager. Most importantly, in the transfer window where they had a busy August. Martin Odegaard was signed on a permanent, having been on loan at the Emirates for the second half of the previous campaign on the same day as Aaron Ramsdale joined the club, a keeper confident with the ball at his feet, which would allow Arsenal to be better in build up play. A week later, and Takahiro Tomiyasu was also signed to replace Hector Bellerin, who also departed on deadline. Day, and was a much stronger option for both right back and centre half, not only providing cover for two positions but also allowing Arteta more freedom to play around with his left back. Taking a look at the tactical side of things, these signings allowed Arteta to play a much more attacking and possession dominant style. However, they were also able to use counter attacking principles in different game situations, particularly against better opposition. Arsenal would initially line up in this 4 2 3 1, however, in possession, we quickly saw Odegaard push up as Lacazette acted more as a false nine, with both players acting as facilitators for runs in behind from Saka and Martinelli or Emil Smith Rowe. And as the season progressed, we slowly saw Xhaka's role evolve from being in a double pivot to pushing higher up the pitch and leaving Thomas Partey as a sole defensive midfielder. Where with Kieran Tierney often holding the whip, it meant Arsenal could start pressing in the attacking third when the ball was lost. In defensive phases, Arsenal aimed to stay compact and utilise the improved passing in the backline to spray balls up the pitch for Saka and Martinez to latch onto. And having been bottom of the league after just three games, we then saw Arsenal as high as fourth with only two games remaining. Before a mix of injuries, mistakes and so on led to a now infamous bottle eventually finishing in 5th place going into the last campaign. 
Over the summer, Jesus and Zinchenko are Arsenal's two notable signings. However, the return of William Saliba from a third loan spell almost acted as the most important one, as we saw this Arsenal side transform massively. Ben White was shifted out to right back, however, rarely actually found himself there as in possession he'd invert to a more defensive role, with Zinchenko pushing up alongside Thomas Partey in midfield, allowing Granit Xhaka to continue his evolution further forward as Arsenal found themselves in a 3-2-5 shape for the majority of each game. Martinelli and Saka were also in much wider positions as Gabriel Jesus' movement and mobility in the front line was a natural upgrade on the recently departed Lacazette as Arsenal started to stretch defences apart and rip teams to shreds. 12 wins from their opening 14 games saw the Gunners 5 points clear going into the World Cup break, continuing that form with 2 wins on the trot before a tense spell of Newcastle, Spurs and Man United, which was set to test the resolve of this side. And I think it's fair to say that they passed with flying colours. The Gunners would then see a rocky spell of 3 straight games without a win though as injuries caused huge issues to this side before a must win match at Villa Park where the Gunners would see the return of Unai Emery. And after 90 minutes the game was level, however an incredible Jorginho strike and a last minute counter left ex-keeper Emi Martinez with egg on his face starting an incredible run featuring its fair share of iconic moments as the Gunners would win 7 on the bounce before a trip to Anfield. Having been 2-0 up early on, they let it slip, eventually drawing the game, repeating the exact same story a week later at the London Stadium. And after a 3-3 draw against Southampton and the title was in City's hands before a huge clash of the Etihad, Arsenal would never be able to recover top spot, losing 4-1 before a 3-0 defeat to Brighton and a 1-0 loss to Nottingham Forest sealed their fate with a game to go. And sure, many people would describe what happened as a huge bottle from Arteta's side. However, they did have to deal with an uncommon amount of injuries and with a lack of squad depth from one or two elite players missing from their starting lineup. It's almost a miracle that they found themselves top in the first place, which brings us to this summer. At the time of writing, Kai Havertz has been announced with Yuri and Timber and Declan Rice all but done deals, as Arsenal looks set to go one step further and hit that 90 point mark of true title contenders. And given that over the last couple of seasons, Arteta has seen his team overperforming before injuries caused issues that he's then learned from, don't be surprised if we see the Gunners ending City's three year spell as Premier League champions. Look, it's impossible to know what will happen in the future, but what we do know is that Mikel Arteta has brought fight and determination back to the Gunners.